I came to New York in 1981 and I was 18 years old. I came to go to college, but I went to a place called Mud Club instead. <laughs> there and he actually came up to me and said you're so beautiful you look so beautiful in this dress and he said you know what? you should meet my friend Jean-Michel and that's how it sort of started where like I met eventually he introduced me to Jean and we all became friends for a while in 1982 I sort of quit my corporate gig I was working for a law firm and I became a full-time trendy and a trendy is people who hang out and work at clubs all their lives so initially I worked at Danceteria. I had started out at working at the elevator where amazing things happened. You know, back then at Club Danceteria, anybody couldn't walk in. Like Studio 54, you had to know the doorman or you couldn't even think about, you know, crossing that velvet rope. And so knowing Joy was like knowing royalty. She really was that important. Joy was a real fashion icon. I was working in my elevator, and I, at that point, had aspirations of actually um, being a graffiti artist or starting to dabble in that world. And so here you can see my joystick little tag. Um, People were tagging uh, buildings and subway trains and things like that. And it was my idea to sort of translate that into fashion. And so what I did was initially I asked Jay Starr if he would write something on my jacket, which he did. On the back of this particular jacket, you'll see a tag, the largest piece is by Shoddy. This whole tag was done by my friend Shoddy, whose name is Dave Skilkin, and Dave Skilkin was a member of the Beastie Boys posse. And so at the time that he was doing this, Dave was just basically a club kid, and he connected with Joy, and Joy gave him free reign to just paint on the back of a jacket. And this whole little piece that says, Why Destroy, and the little character with the feathers, that was uh, Dominic. You have so many things here that are going on. You know, there's a tag for me right there. And you have, uh, you know, some other graffiti folks that I hung out with at the time. There was uh, Energy, which was a, a guy named John Starr, who was a, a up-and-coming rapper at the time. Dante Ross, tag system, and Dante is a big music producer right now. And so at the time, he was just another kid tagging graffiti. My jacket, this particular one, translated into a wall, and everyone wanted to hit it up, so to speak, right? Everyone came in the club, they saw me in the jacket, and they wanted to hit the piece. She only let A-list artists tag it, though. Believe me, there were a lot of people that, you know, they didn't, you know, you didn't just walk up and just start tagging on her jacket. She had to know who you were. Though at the time, everybody that tagged on this jacket was really young, a lot of these people are really important artists today. And that just goes to show that even though we were young and people thought we were immature and that we weren't completely serious and dedicated to our art, they were absolutely wrong. You know, Zephyr is on there. He's still making work today. James Top, uh, needless to say, Keith Haring, myself, Revolt. It's, uh, it's just got so many great memories. Obviously, Jean-Michel has a little crown right there. Futura 2000 is on here. Uh, Stash. Everybody that I grew up with. It, it's just, it's really phenomenal. I think one thing that's important to remember about these jackets is that they were on my body. 
as people tag them. So I really have a memory of having this on my body and Keith Haring on his knees. He actually got down on his knees because of my height and drew this. So I could feel like, you know, him etching against my back and things like that. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. This is not an image that you see replicated throughout Keith's work if you were to look at the body of work. So it really speaks to his improvisation and the spirit of where we were at that particular time on that night and the energy of the club, um, but also the energy of art. We were all doing something. And this one is actually a little, little bit more of an elite selection of people. You have Futura, Keith Haring, Fab Five, Freddy. You know, most of the guys on this jacket are all the high-end guys. They are the top tier and during that period. Artists also knew, particularly graffiti artists, if you knew that Futura was here, you almost had to t do something to top Futura. So whoever, got the, the person who did the last tag always did something better to sort of contradict or up the up some upmanship for the next artist so in a way it speaks to that and I think that's why Keith per Keith Herring is the last person to touch this jacket once I got Keith's tag I sort of put it away because I didn't think that anything could be better than Keith This is a really special piece, and this um, this actually happened on the night of Keith Haring's Party of Life. I went to the party with Jean-Michel and Andy Warhol. They were my two sidekicks that night, and I asked Andy if he would sign it, if he would tag it for me. And it was amazing. If you can see, Andy wrote immediately his name, Andy, and my name. And after that, Jean tagged it as well. And this became a piece in and of itself. This was the first time that I had done something that was outside of the jacket. And only Jean-Michel and Andy Warhol are on this piece. And I rocked it that whole night. <laughs> Here are two pieces that um, people, artists are saying, can I do something for you? Can you wear my work, right? And that's a different level of representation. And it speaks to the true nature of our friendship. That I wore this skirt all the time. And so I gave it up to say for a few weeks so that he could work on the piece. And I loved it, I wore it like all the time and sometimes I interchange the pieces. I was the canvas. I was a walking canvas for graffiti art in New York. If you know anything about the history of graffiti, block letters is something that was really um, popular back in the early 80s because it was somewhat easy to do but also, just creating things that had sort of a rock formation was really popular. And so, in this particular situation, Joy asked me to paint a jacket. And the, the thing that was really tricky about painting on leather is that you had to do something that wouldn't crack. And so I thought, what can I do that, you know, maybe won't crack, but if it did crack, you wouldn't notice it quite as much. And so I thought about doing a rock formation because when it started to weather, it would just add to the design. And so that's really what that was. And as you can see, 30 years later, I was kind of right about that. So this is mostly done with spray paint. And as you can see, all of the little splatter and you know a lot of that is like you know brush techniques and, and just kind of spritzing the spray can. But it really holds up well. Revolt did this jacket for me, in fact, his nickname was Revolt, but we called him Revy for short. 
and this is a representation by revolt of me at the time my spiked hair or his imaginary version of me as a graffiti artist this is an exquisite piece on a jean jacket Jean-Michel's first opening, his first solo exhibit at a big gallery, which was Mary Boone, was a really big deal. Jean had invited me to go. And um, at this point in time, I had been modeling for Jean. I had been sitting for Jean. Um, Jean paid me, in fact, $75 an hour to sit for him. And the result of um, that time that I spent with him were two paintings, one which was eventually titled Big Joy and the second which is called Red Joy. So in preparation for Jean's opening, I actually bought this white jacket from a vintage store and I had a black marker <laughs> in my hand. <laughs> and, um, and I went there with the full intent to have this jacket tagged. For me. I knew that because it was Jean's show, other important and significant artists would be there, including Andy and Jean and others, of course. When I got there, you know, looking at the work, Jean had another painting that also had a depiction of the diamond mines in South Africa. You know, people were just starting to talk about apartheid and sort of having a political response to what was occurring in South Africa. And when I saw that painting, I was so moved. And I said to John, I, I love this work. John actually did sort of a replica, if you will, of that painting on my jacket. And you see that here, Jean-Michel wrote Africa. Andy Warhol actually crossed out Africa and wrote Andy Warhol <laughs> instead. Well, one of the things that is really clear if you know anything about Jean's work is that he had this sort of staticky style that he draws in. It's always kind of like, you know, really stiff, really stiff. And you can, you can see it, you know, that's how I can identify that that was his work because you know, unlike somebody like Keith, who had a really fluid hand all the time, there's never any breaks when he draws. Jean Michel was always like skipping. And you know, you look at Crash's signature, it, it, it's flowing like water. You look at Jean's, and it's, you know, it's really stiff. And this jacket really speaks to the clever nature of Jean Michel. Because here, if you look in this section, it's really a face. You know, and again, I'm wearing this, right? So Jean had the markers against my breast, and yet he was able to manifest this face out, out of the shape. This is dated. And then Crash and Days, who were two other significant, like sort of senior graffiti artists, if you will, were there. And Jean specifically asked them, he said, you know, to honor them, could you guys please sign this as well? And then we asked Mary Boone, well, Jean-Michel asked Mary Boone. Well, one thing is very clear looking at this, and I know that Joy knew it right from the start. Andy Warhol's signature was a big deal, right from the start. And he was just the nicest guy. And what was surprising to us was how excited he was to be around us. And I remember just constantly getting chills just being with him because he became part of, you know, Jean-Michel and Keith Haring's little entourage. And because we were all friends, we all rolled together. And just constantly seeing him out and about was just unbelievable to me. To be able to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with him about art and music and culture was really strange. Now, at the time, I'm an 18, 19-year-old kid, and he's you know, a grown man. He probably was in his 50s then. And it was just so bizarre. One of the things about all of these jackets is that while I may have curated them and while I may have had a hand in the creation of the work, they actually don't belong in my house. 
they belong somewhere else. They belong in the museum. They belong in the collection so that someone else in history can help preserve the significance of this work because we'll never see this again.